Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Swickley Academy Winter 2015 webinar series. My name is Brendan Schneider, and I'm the Director of Admission and Financial Aid at Swickley Academy. Today our webinar is titled Empowering Girls and will be conducted by Dr. Shannon Mulholland, our Director of Support Services. Before I turn the presentation over to Shannon, I wanted to highlight the remaining two webinars in our series. Um, next Thursday, February 5th, uh, Patty Butts will deliver a webinar titled We Don't Teach to the Test. And then on February 12th, Dr. Geraldine Scott and Mr. Matt Michaels will conduct a webinar about the math program at SA. There's still time to register. If you go to sewickley.org slash webinar, you can register. And as with the uh, previous webinars, I will record them. And if you can't make it at that day and time, I will send you the recording. Just a little housekeeping. If you'd like to ask a question, we'll take questions at the end. On the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar panel, you'll see, um, again, right there, the little question box. Just type your question into the box, and then I'll read those to Shannon at the end. And then we will be on uh, 30 minutes, plus or minus, um, we'll be respectful of your time and hopefully end by 1 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. And as I mentioned earlier, this is recorded, so I will send you the recording hopefully sometime tomorrow. So, Shannon, let me give you control. Okay, great. Can you hear me? I can hear you, and I'm just waiting to see your screen. Yep. Okay. I see it, and if you go present... Oh, I see the tree growing. Okay. <laughs> Looks good. Take it away, Shana. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to go. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, this afternoon's topic is Empowering Girls. As Brendan said, the presentation is about 25 minutes long. We will leave some time at the end for questions from you guys. Again, my name is Shannon Mulholland. I've been a teacher and a counselor for 22 years years. I have um, my doctorate in education and my master's degree in special education and I've spent nearly all of my time in working in schools. For the past 13 years I've been the director of support services at Swickley Academy where I work with kids and families and teachers and I help coordinate for children inside and outside of the classroom when there is some support needed. Uh, today we're focused on empowering girls. There is so much coverage on this very popular and very important topic, and some of it's a little bit scary. We read some horror stories about mean girls and bullies and the sometimes very serious consequences our girls suffer from as a result of being on the receiving end. And we know that some of the role models out there for our children that they see in the media and on the big screen are not the best and focus too much on body image and catching the attention of the opposite gender. However, today is about focusing on our role as parents, as teachers, as coaches, and what we can do on a daily build basis to help and build empowerment. I suspect that the points that I'm going to make today are just reminders to you about what you can emphasize as you help your daughter hear her own voice and build her sense of confidence. There are three specific areas to target today, which I hope will prompt some reflection and some thinking about you and your child and where you both are on your journey toward empowerment. So the first one is be her role model. Teach her to build authentic relationships. And foster a sense of self-confidence and self-efficacy. So first if we think about be her role model. What an important job we have as parents. I gotta say, it's sometimes overwhelming to think of the responsibility that we have in our hands to raise children who are happy and healthy, independent, problem solvers, creative, responsible, and who are just good people who contribute positively to the world. How do we accomplish all of that? 
And is there a window of time that passes and then it's too late to instill all of those values that you had in mind when that child was just a baby? Well, the answer is no. It's never too late. And in fact, we'd never stop parenting. Our job shifts along the way, but we're always the parent and there's always opportunity for us to grow in that role. So the first step on the path to building empowerment is to think of your own background. Get to know yourself. Look at your mother, look at your grandmother, and reflect on the traits and values that they may have passed to you. My own mother was the first female in her family to graduate from college. She had a full-time job all while we were growing up, and she continues to work today. Her mother also worked throughout her children's childhood. So there were very specific values that I know were instilled in me that came directly from my mom and from her mother. And one of them certainly was go to work. In your family, maybe it's strong faith, maybe it's family first, maybe it's creativity, maybe it's commitment to community building that your mother instilled in you. So just think about what you are passing on to your daughter and if it paves the way for empowerment. Then we want to check our attitudes and our own actions. So we're still reflecting on ourselves as role models. We live in a very competitive culture. Our ch children learn very quickly that we are comparing them to each other and to children in other families. So if the Davis family has signed up for soccer, then we should too. If the so-and-so family will apply to an Ivy League school, then my daughter should be able to do that also. Well, we have to stop competing as much as we are. It's so obvious to our children, and we're teaching them that they're in a race against each other instead of with each other. They quickly learn to get in the game and to jockey for the best grades, the most extracurricular activities they could have, attention from boys, and to be the so-called queen bee or in the group with her. So just think to yourself, what is your personal attitude about women in the world. Do you find yourself expecting different behaviors from boys than you do from girls? For example, there are times maybe when we excuse our boys by saying, oh, boys will be boys. Well, we expect our girls to uphold the best manners, a warm smile, and a good mood. We send that message sometimes to girls that what we expect from them is different kind of public behavior than what we expect of boys. So just think about your own attitudes and actions in your home. Avoid sarcasm. Sarcasm breeds a lack of clarity and an internal instability. Your daughter will learn quickly that she can be sarcastic to others, and if they are offended, she can say, well, I was just kidding. I heard a mother say to her daughter recently, hey, look, if you didn't wear that frown on your face all the time, then maybe more people would like you. And her daughter said, mom, that's terrible. And her mom replied, oh, sweetie, it's just a joke. Come on, lighten up. So in two sentences, her mother expressed her opinion that was not positive toward her daughter and then excused it by saying it was a joke but then expected her daughter to laugh along with her, even though neither one of them was joking. Role modeling is so much of what helps our girls become strong young women. And because of our limited time today, these are just a very few points of reflection for you. So consider spending some time in the next few days examining the role modeling that you are doing. Trust me, the girls are watching, they're picking up on the moves that you make, they're picking up on the tone and what you verbalize. So for starters, you know, just think about your own upbringing and what you value. Think about checking your own attitudes and actions. And then consider curbing your use of sarcasm, if that's something you tend to do. Our next point is teach her to build authentic relationships. Building authentic relationships is extremely important to our girls. 
They want to be connected and deeply rooted with friends and family to support them along the way. They really crave connection with you, with their peers, with their coaches, with their teachers. They learn early how to build those connections. But they can stray from understanding what an authentic relationship looks and feels like. Again, the focus on competi competition and achievement can get in the way of building authentic relationships. Devotion to winning may set your daughter up for success in that area, but may leave her feeling kind of alone. Girls often feel more empowered by actually showing an act of kindness to others or understanding how to support a friend in need. These skills just can't be devalued. So don't stop teaching empathy and kindness in an effort to help them understand what authentic relationships look and feel like. Even in fourth grade, and actually especially in fourth grade, when sometimes that competition really starts to ramp up, it's a good time to go back and teach some empathy and kindness again. It feels really good to the girls. They feel really empowered when they understand what empathy and kindness look like. Teach her to be direct and clear. Girls need to vent. And I bet some of you have sat for many hours listening to a rant of your daughter, no matter what age, over another friend at school. Those rants can be accompanied by tears, exuberance, loathing, even bewilderment. And sometimes they include the range of these emotions all at the same time. Sometimes the venting seems so emotionally charged that you're thinking there must be something that needs to be done immediately. Because we're problem solvers. We like to protect our children, and sometimes this urge causes us to intervene for them or to feel that we need to intervene quickly. Try to understand that your, what your daughter's level of concern is. Maybe you could ask, are we just venting or should you do something about this? Because if we're just venting, I'm happy to listen, but there are limits on the time we are going to devote to this frustration. Let's talk for 20 minutes and then let's move on to something more productive. If we need to act, I'll help guide you to what seems appropriate. So you see we're putting some, you know, upfront understanding, is this venting or are we really going to do something about it? Putting some parameters on the time, uh, if it's just venting, that we're going to spend on doing that before we move on to something more productive. If action is called for, talk to her about how she can express what she is feeling to that classmate. Talk directly to that classmate. Girls need to learn it's okay to say what they think directly to the person who sparked the emotion. Too often we allow our girls to talk behind each other's back or to keep their feelings to themselves. The guideline here is that you can say nearly anything that you want to as long as you attend to some specifics. Talk specifically, the girl talks specifically about what she heard or observed. Talk specifically about how she perceived it. And then make a specific recommendation about what she suggests. So these are conversations that you want to preview at home while also attending to tone, language, and refraining from accusation. So a quick example might be something like this. The, um, the girl who is frustrated goes back to school and says, Meredith, do you have a minute to talk to me today? I have something I want to share with you. And when they get a chance to talk. I heard you say to me yesterday that I was trying too hard to be skinny and I should just give it up because I'll never, never be successful. It was hard for me to hear you talk about me that way. At the time, I didn't know what to say. I'm doing my best to get through middle school. Today, I just wanted to let you know how I felt and also that I don't expect you to say anything like that to me again. It was offensive and wrong. That's being very direct. This young girl is telling the other, it hurt me 
it was offensive and wrong. And she's specific about what she heard Meredith say to her. Teach her to be appropriately aggressive, not passively aggressive. When it's time for confrontation, our girls have to be prepared to step into it. They have to understand how to modulate their voice so that the receiver knows they are serious. Too often girls laugh or joke their way through a difficult conversation or retreat with tears. Now I'm not saying it's not okay to laugh or cry. It is okay. Those are natural reactions for all of us and it's okay to do that. But girls have to be prepared to have a serious tone in their voice to get the message across. This is also something that we really have to practice. We have to practice changing pitch from high to low or from casual to serious. So instead of talking up here and trying to make the point that way, we teach our girls to lower their voice a bit and have a bit more serious tone, purposeful tone in what they're saying. Next is to use body language that says I'm serious. Sit up in your seat. Stand upright, own what you are saying. Try to maintain a serious face. Sometimes our face says, this is funny, I'm not serious, and what we are saying is very serious. So if your body language says that you're sad or afraid or uncomfortable, your message could be lost. So again, previewing and practicing this at home at an early age is really helpful. What are you going to look like? when you have this conversation with your friend? What will your body look like? How will you be positioned? In an urgent or elevated situation, our girls have to be ready to say, stop what you are saying or stop what you are doing now to another person. Teach them, if you can envision this, teach them to position their pointer finger in the air like we do when we're um, wagging our finger at somebody, but teach them to position that pointer finger in the air and combine that visual with a verbal stop. There's no touching involved here. It's just a hand gesture combined with the voice and the body language that is not mistaken for anything else but serious. So the finger is up and we say stop what you are doing, stop what you are saying, and then you can follow up, it is offensive, it is wrong, or, you know, whatever the next comment might be. But again, appropriately aggressive, appropriately assertive, it's okay for girls to understand at a ver very early age when to say, that's enough and I'm serious. If girls learn this early, how to handle confrontation in a serious manner, with tone, with body language, and with verbal clear direction, they're prepared to handle tough situations later as they mature. So navigating friendships, some tricky business. In this one, we're talking about discerning good and bad investments. Help your daughter recognize who is a good and bad investment for them. This is not to suggest that people are good or bad. It simply means that at times, one person or another may be a good investment. So good investments are those people who make you feel good about yourself. You walk away from a conversation feeling energized and wanting more of what that person has to offer. A bad investment would be those who make you feel bad about yourself. You're constantly sad or second-guessing yourself after a brief encounter with them. We have to realize that at times in our lives, one person or another may not be right for us. Too often our girls go back again and again to the person who makes them feel badly about themselves. We have to know when it's time to put our energies into the good investments and stop putting all of our efforts into trying to make a bad investment pay off. So talk with your girls about friends in this way. Is she a good investment? Why? How does she make you feel? Is she a bad investment? Why is that? Maybe you need some space and time away. Help your girls build good investments and positive connections. So don't hesitate to orchestrate 
the start of a friendship group, especially for young girls. If your daughter has similar interests to several, several other girls in her class, start a book club, a running club, jewelry making, robotics. Have something like this um, at your home once a month. It's a great time for girls to focus on a positive project. They listen, they talk to each other, and they learn how to support and build each other up. This goes a long way with the building of empathy and kindness. When girls are working together, they get a better understanding of how to do that, how to be supportive, how to be trusting, how to be united with each other. And you can really build some good connections and good investments that way. So again, to review, uh, brief reminders when helping our girls build authentic relationships, continue to teach empathy and kindness, teach her to be direct and clear, teach her to be appropriately aggressive, and help her to discern the good from bad investments. The third point is fostering self-confidence and self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is our understanding of where we are skilled. And our girls need to know quickly that they have a reason to feel good about themselves and a reason to feel skilled and competent. Girls sometimes feel that they have to be this perfect little image of beauty and intelligence and power all at one time. So help your daughter foster her own interests and what makes her feel happy, even if it's different from what you value. Let her explore what gives her a charge, dance, music, sports, robotics, poetry, whatever it might be. If you value what she values, she will begin to develop her confidence. It's when you second guess her interests and her image of herself that she starts to feel vulnerable. We tend to tie confidence building, again, to achievement. But look for the non-achievement ways to let your daughter know that she's accomplished and that she matters. So in other words, it's not always when you win or when you get the A or when you're the best at something when you feel confident. Maybe your daughter loves to spend time with her little cousin and she feels really good about her skill as a babysitter or a caretaker. Maybe your daughter wants to develop her creativity through making rubber band bracelets and it makes her feel really good to distribute them to all of her friends to wear. So value these skills as well. They allow her to begin to build a really solid base for confidence. Building self-confidence also comes when other needs are met. Part of the humanist perspective in psychology theorizes that we develop our self-esteem after some basic needs are met. So those needs at first are our physiological needs. So that means um, our need for food, our need for sleep, um, our need for shelter. Our next need would be safety needs. Do we feel safe in the environment that we're in? Our next need is called our belonging need. Do we feel like we belong and we fit? And the next then is self-esteem needs. So for example, on the path to feeling competent and confident at school, I can do my best work when I feel well rested. I'll bet we all can relate to this. Have you ever gone to work or you know, just started a, a project where you really need to focus and you're really tired? So you can't, you can't do your best work when you're really tired or when you're really hungry or even if you have to go to the restroom. So we need those physiological needs to be met before we can move up to trying to feel self-confident and have a stronger self-esteem. Um, I can do my best work if I feel safe. There are situations in other countries where safety is truly, truly an issue in terms of physical safety. Someone might not feel safe anywhere, in their own home, out on the street. Um, I shouldn't say in other countries. That's true in our country as well, for sure. Um, so when you're not feeling safe, your path to confidence building is impaired. Um, again, with this sample of school, I know I can do my best work at school when I feel safe, when I don't feel like I'm going to be teased or made to feel badly about myself while I'm working. 
I can do my best work when I feel like I belong. There are people in my class who share my interests and I feel like I fit with this group. I'm sure we've all had that experience too, where we don't feel comfortable and confident because we don't feel like we belong in the group that we're in. So as we help our children build confidence, help your child get the proper rest that they need, Maintain a well-balanced diet, getting some exercise along the way, and attend to any health issues so that we can help as much with those physiological needs. Set them up in situations that feel safe. Talk about feeling safe at home and at school. Involve other adults when you feel like your child's physical or emotional safety is at risk. Involve professionals that you have access to that may be helpful, school counselors, nurses, ministers, uh, if you need support in that way. And then help them recognize how they fit in and how they can develop that sense of belonging on their way to feeling more confident. So as we come to the end of the presentation today, I hope that I've planted some seeds that grow into conversations you have with your daughter or thoughts that you'll mull over. We have such influence in our position as parents and as teachers and as coaches. And it's our job to help our girls develop a sense of empowerment. So what do you think you can do to contribute? Be her role model. Help her build authentic relationships. Foster self-confidence and self-efficacy. So thanks again for tuning in today, and please send some questions my way. I'm happy to answer the best that I can. Hi, Shannon. Thanks. Let me see. I'm looking at the question uh, pane right now. I don't have any questions. I can wait for another minute to see if anybody <clears throat> wants to ask something. Um, I also, um, my last slide, I'll, I'll wait, you know, while we're waiting if people have questions, um, is just a few resources, some books that I've read that I um, have really helped me in my work um, at home and at school, so I'll provide those as well when we're finished. Great. Here's a question uh, for you, Shannon. How do you build self-efficacy? Okay, so again, self-efficacy is really about our um, learned understanding of where we are skilled. So I think the best way to build it is first that exposure piece, to really let your girls get involved in as much as possible so they can really start to understand where they do feel skilled. Um, and again, appreciate skills that are not necessarily achievement-based skills as you know somebody who's especially good at navigating with friends somebody who has a great sense of humor somebody who is especially kind we can have high self-efficacy in those areas as well and those are wonderful skills for building um, wonderful adults so I think exposure and then appreciating and being open to all kinds of skills where your child can excel is the best way to build it. Great. Let me see here. There are a number of questions flying in now. Um, can Shannon make a printed or digital copy of this speech for listeners? Actually, yes. I will send the recording, um, which includes the slides and Shannon's voice, to everybody sometime tomorrow. Would you say that it's harder to empower a female child as a single parent? Uh, how do you go about this when many friends come from two-parent homes? Yeah, I am sure there are challenges there, absolutely. Um, I think it's difficult to be a, a single parent on many levels, but I absolutely know that uh, many single parents in, in my work along the way who have been tremendous role models and really, really can empower their girls in very significant ways. So don't feel that you, because there is not another person with you partnering, um, that you're impaired in any way. You still have the opportunity to be very influential. And then again, allowing your child to be exposed to lots of other opinions and um, 
diverse backgrounds, so involvement with other family members, other adults who can be supportive, I think is really helpful. But I just want to emphasize that it doesn't put you at a disadvantage as a single parent. I just know it's it's challenging. Okay, great. Um, let's see here, Shannon. When a child is having trouble making friends, how do you help them out? Well, I, I thought about um, you know some of this orchestrating. It depends on the age of the child, but young kids may really need you to help build some of those friend groups for them. Um, you know, sometimes they need us to put together kids with similar interests and um, kids who we are sort of plucking out as good investments for them when they're younger. That's that's pretty important for us to do. As they get older, you know, really just talking with them about what are their interests, where do they feel skilled, who can we identify has similar interests. That's always a good place to start with similar interests um, and encouraging them to seek and find places where they feel like they fit. Okay. Uh, let's see here. How do you help more explosive emotions? And there's a description. My seven-year-old takes things very seriously and adds emotional charge to situations that could be solved calmly, for example, after being called names. Mm -hmm. Well, without knowing more, um, I think that you know, we have to watch this with our girls. So we have some girls who really lead with strong emotion. And we have to be the adult who sort of judges how emotional do we think this really is. Is this too much emotion in this situation? Should it be dialed back a little? Or am I not listening to my child's voice and I really need to hear that emotion and help them manage um, where to put it. So um, I think for an explosive child, putting those limits on the conversation will be important. You know, I, I can hear myself saying to someone, you know, I, you have a lot of emotion about this right now and we are going to talk all the way through it. But then, you know, in a half an hour, we're going to turn to something more positive, more productive that makes you feel a little bit better. Not that not that venting the frustration is not productive, but just turning attention to something more positive then. So I think explosive children have to have the opportunity to get it out. They, have, they need help understanding how emotional the situation really is. And that doesn't mean you're saying to them, oh, you need to settle down. This isn't really very emotional. That's kind of discounting their feelings. But helping them dial it back. Okay, let me hear you. Use language to describe what you're feeling. Let me see you relax your shoulders when you're talking to me about this. Let me see you relax the muscles in your face. I think that will help you feel better. So helping them kind of pull back from that strong emotion and get more clarity um, with what needs to happen. Great. Shannon, two more questions, and then we'll, then we'll take – that'll be all for today, just to be respectful of time. Sure. What does a girl do when her serious objections to a wrong action on the part of her friends are ignored or belittled? When her serious objections to the wrong action – say that one more time, when her so, serious – So what does a girl do when her serious objections to a wrong action on the part mm -hmm. of her friends are mm -hmm. ignored or belittled? Okay, so I, I'm not sure if this means ignored by her peers or ignored by adults that she's talking to, um, and that and that does does matter. So I, I, I'm going to assume it's, that it it's, means uh, Shannon, her peers. Yeah, her, her peers. Okay, so her peers are not seeing or hearing or reacting in the same way that she is to whatever she sees as the wrong doing. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 a lot of this depends on talking through the, the actual uh, situation as it occurs. So maybe as a parent you can say, I want to hear what you saw or what you heard that you thought was wrong, and then I want to hear what you said or did in reaction to that. I want to know how you feel. 
And then I want to know what your peers said or did in reaction to your reaction. Because sometimes we hear our girls say, well, she said this and did this and it was wrong, and I told all of my friends what she did. And then other girls perceive this as, um, uh, I'm going to say this gently, but trying to make trouble or tattling or um, turning against someone. Um, and so they turn away from it. They don't want to listen. They might not want to intervene in any way. So some of it is presentation on the, the recipient or the receiver's part. So if she saw or heard something that she thought was wrong, how she reacts to that is pretty important. So what did she say to those peers? And what was the purpose of her telling them? Was she telling them to rally their support, or was she telling them to try to help this young lady do something differently? So without knowing more, I, I, I can't say any more about that one. Okay, and then the final question. Uh, would you say that putting girls in activities helps with the empowering? Now there's a little description here. I have a teenager, 16, however, she is no longer interested in the things that she used to like. However, she doesn't really want to try new things. Now the complaint is she doesn't have any friends. Okay. Well, I definitely think getting involved is a good good way to, to find empowerment often. But sometimes we direct too much what kids get involved in. You know, so if I was a swimmer and I want my daughter to be a swimmer, and then I find out when she hits adolescence that swimming is just really not her gig, um, I have to hear that. I have to be able to turn in another direction with her. So sometimes this message is, I just don't want to do what you want me to do as my parent. And sometimes the message is, I'm overscheduled. I'd like to be less busy. Um, so we have to watch for that. We have to watch that, you know, is there another message here to me that I'm not seeing or hearing? But um, again, I think getting involved in activities is definitely important. Being open to switching activities, being open to trying new things. Um, I have to say, I never stop making suggestions on different kinds of activities. What about this? Would you like to try this? How busy would you like to be? Um, some people need more downtime than others, so they don't want to be overscheduled. Um, let your daughter explore and come up with her ideas um, of, of an activity. So what I've said in the past is, I'd like you to pick an activity of some kind. I don't care what it is, but by next Tuesday, we're going to discuss an activity that you've decided you want to be involved in. So I've kind of taken the choice out of it there and said, you know, it's going to be something, so, but you pick it. Okay, sounds great. Shannon, great questions, everybody, and thanks for a great presentation. We are over time. So I uh, just wanted to thank everybody, remind you again that you'll receive the recording to this webinar and the slides uh, sometime tomorrow. Shannon, do you want to talk about the resources? I'm sorry. No, no, I just popped that up there. It's, okay. it's time to go. I appreciate everybody listening. Thank you so much. Feel free to email me if there's any follow-up question or conversation you want to have with me. Sounds great. Thanks again, Shannon, and we'll see everybody hopefully next week, same time, same day. Bye-bye. Okay, great. Bye-bye.